They use the mass of the machine itself. They've got all kinds of dampening agents and insulators of all forms. The electricity is insulated at every level. They've got disconnects everywhere and just only little tiny bits touching, sort of at a, a capillary kind of a fashion, right? All to isolate the qubits so that our consciousness does not intrude. And then the way the programming is set up, when you run your program and you hit push the enter button, you do not know, you cannot know when it's actually going to run because that might intrude. Now, now there's a corollary. Are some people so conscious that they're going to intrude and they couldn't be around these machines? Perhaps so. Well, this brings okay. us back even to your remote viewers and what happens there. Yeah. Correct. And that we'll get back to that in a minute. Okay. But let me let me get us to ent entanglement here in the Mandela effect. Nice. Okay. okay. And hormesis. Okay. Because see, here's what the Mandela effect is in my understanding. It's the intrusion of quantum computers into our social order. Totally. Because everywhere they put one of those quantum computers, we see Mandela effect erupting in that general area. And the very first levels of Mandela effect that we saw anywhere were around the laboratories in the Northeast where they were developing some of these quantum computers up here in Canada where they were in development in BC. And then later, the very first machines that were sold were put into NASA. And we see a, and a, we see a, a variant of the Mandela effect show up in Texas with the, with the Bible. You know, was it lie down with the wolf or lie down with the lion? That kind of thing showing up <clears throat> all around the, the intrusion of these machines. Because if I am correct, what they're doing with these machines is, and we, we're going to think about this in a very crude, gross fashion, but they're shoving all the consciousness out of the machine itself into the general environment. And in essence, creating a bow wave, if you will, or a denser area of consciousness around the machines. And it's going to have to leak out and dissipate yeah. and, you know, and even itself out because universe is self-healing. Okay. And in the process, it's creating a Mandela effect even if that is only missed memory, this is coming from the D-Wave computer or from quantum computers, not D-Wave specifically. Okay, so the next question, I have to ask this. Is the, and maybe this is a far reach, but that's what I do. <laughs> are these, in my, in my opinion, when a lot of them are created cold fronts, are these an attempt to, to reduce humans consciousness or to reduce humans consciousness ability to affect things? So you have really, really cold fronts going into places like Texas and lots of places in the United right. States, right? Is, does the cold affect the ability of humans to project their consciousness in a way that it might permeate or penetrate into these, 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 these not as you're thinking probably because cold is, is our, is our friend as a meditator, as a, uh, someone who's attempting to deal with consciousness, uh, cold is actually very good as is extreme heat, heat over right. um, a specific level. And I, I can't think of the level now. It's like but, but just because, because you were talking about how cooling is part of this process to keep the consciousness right. out. Right, okay, now the reason that they're doing that to keep the consciousness out though is they're trying to, they don't see it as consciousness, okay? They see it as spin or vibration. You okay. Don't, you don't hear these guys talking about consciousness. You hear okay, them talking spin. about yeah. vibration and you it's hear good. them talking about yeah. uh, potential and probability, yeah. the collapse of the probability field, all yes. relating to spin. And so they're trying to get out any kind of vibration that's affecting the machine. And of course, even if you have vacuumed out air, the best vacuum pumps can't take out all the molecules. Right. So those nope. stray molecules might cause the qubits to do something. So they chill the whole area before they fire off the machine. And they chill it down to uh, like minus 400 degree Kelvin. Yeah. I mean, we're talking almost absolute zero, right? as cold as they can possibly make it at huge cost to do this. It's not like a, you know, it's not like a, um, uh, you're doing Bitcoin mining and you've got an oil, oil cooled mining rig to get rid of the excess heat. These guys are serious about it and the heat doesn't, it, there's no external heat, so to okay, speak. Okay, so there's no way that this cold, this weather kind of cold could be creating sort of like a virtual shield to, 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 for, to stop not, human consciousness yeah. penetrating. Yeah, that's not part okay. of this. No, no, that's okay. not part of this. Okay? You understand why I was thinking that. Sure, possibly. sure. And it sort of makes sense, but it actually, uh, you'll find that um, uh, psychic abilities are actually enhanced by extreme cold. Extreme heat and extreme cold. Yeah, correct, yeah, right. correct. 
Okay, so, and that again has to do with the adrenals, right? right. And the response of the body to those conditions, the shutting down of the circulation, the pumping up of the heart and so on. But anyway, so getting back to this. So if I'm correct about this, this is a postulate. This is what we're going to test in reality over these next couple of years. But if I'm correct, here's what's going to happen. Every time they introduce a, a bigger, uh, greater class of, of qubit machine into a new environment, more instances of Mandela effect in new varieties will show up in that environment, and then they'll gradually dampen off. And then there'll be another outbreak, and it'll gradually dampen off and so on and so on and so on. And, and what's happening is our consciousness, our uh, fill rate of our own consciousness within our own toroidal bodies is affected by all of this other baser consciousness being shoved out into our areas. So, so when, when you're saying that these are gonna, these instances this is, are gonna occur more often and because the, there are starting to be more of these, would this also be Part of the explanation as to why people are starting to have what they consider to be personal Mandela effects. Like yes. our friend Danny McKinney talked about literally a piece of art appeared on the wall in her house that she had never seen before. Like there was that there, on her stairwell, there's a series of art that is all like of a specific kind, like a specific, from a specific period of time, right? And it's always been there. And then all of a sudden one day, there's a totally different kind of art top of the stairs that is not correlated to the rest that she had never seen before. Right, now here's, the, here's our problem, okay? Uh, she's 100% correct in her impression, but she could be 100% wrong. The art might have been there for 20 damn years, and mm -hmm. what's actually happened has occurred only in her connection to her own memory, right? Okay. Okay, so the, so the time, so part of the Mandela effect need not involve any time uh, intrusion at all, all right? It, it need not involve uh, any of this, of the reality there. Uh, what may be occurring is that, that our brains are simply reacting to the consciousness that's being shoved out of all of these machines. And mm -hmm. every time they fire it up, there's this wave that goes out and so on, such that we develop a, a, a dysfunctional connection to our yeah. own memories relative to what's going on and that we're temporally uh, messed with, if you will. For, for and, just what you described is why I prefer to call it the Mandela effect as opposed to the Mandela, Mandela effect. effect. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I, yeah. I get you. And yeah. also it's related to missing time. Yes. Now, the reason I say this is that there are some, some things, people that have had missing time where they've seen a UFO and then in a very specific set of circumstances, okay? You're, you're not just walking along and missing time, but there's some trigger event that, and then later there's a period of missing time. There, there are specific responses within the body to that level of missing time. And there's a, a weird um, or, or an uh, aberrant uh, connection in your own body to your own past, to where there's a gap, okay? And, and that is in a sense, or rather in a sensation level, mm -hmm. that occurs in part of your brain and that same part of the brain is affected by the Mandela effect. Okay. All right, so, yeah. so maybe the, the missing time is caused by them shooting you with a ray gun and then they, my lab grabs you and does weird yeah. stuff and shoves say, stuff the in your body. The applications are aimed at the same part of the brain that are affected by the Mandela effect. Correct, okay, correct. Yeah. And so the Mandela effect is really a, is also a, um, a side effect of the technological society that we're getting into, right? Now you went somewhere earlier when we started this dog leg and you were talking about manipulating time. Now, my understanding would be, this is kind of a Plato's cave kind of situation that you cannot manipulate time within time. You have to step out of time. Can you step out of time? Or is this what, is this what quantum is doing? Is it because time is, because quantum computing is isolated. It is capable of doing what we can't do, which is to manipulate the fabric of time. Or am I misinterpreting? No, to, no, you're, is you're correct. To, is it you're trying correct. to control time by isolating it from consciousness so that consciousness can't have any effect on time? In other words, observationally, we can't really, we do manipulate constantly our own time streams, but we're still synchronized within the pulsing clock that is the universal consciousness that is synced to all of these different cycles that we have, that our right. biological cycles the sun, the moon, uh, all of the seasonal stuff, but there's something that sits outside of it that has the ability to directly manipulate this. It cannot be part of the thing that it is manipulating, correct? Correct, but the qubit isn't gonna be used directly that way. 
So the qubit, the, these quantum computers. I assume that I assume that if it can be used that way, it would be used that correct, way. Correct. Correct. I'm okay. quite certain that that would be the case. But yeah. the amount of energy required to do the kind of manipulation you're talk about, talking about, which is to alter the ever present now, which is fundamentally what these people are attempting to do, Got is it. the kind of things that you have to you have to have a CERN for, right? You got to have more electricity than has ever been generated anywhere to even try to fiddle with this sort of stuff. And so that's what they're trying to do is they're trying to, to alter the pulse and so on. In essence, the quantum computer guys are trying to alter the pulse just by keeping it out, keeping out, dampening down some of those vibrations that the, that the pulse brings you, in. If through you the, do that, if you, if you keep it out, th is that isolation of it affect the pulse everywhere else? So they're correct. affecting the pulse? Okay, yeah, yeah. It, it increases the complexity. It makes the, the pulse shift over, so to speak, and the area around the quantum computer is a lot more dense. Okay. with consciousness. Tellingly, we have many of the um, creators of the, or at least one of them famously, I think the guy's name is Gordy Rose or whatever, yeah. was, was saying that, you know, standing next to the D-Wave computer was like praying at the altar to an alien, alien god. god. Yeah. Right. And why is he saying that? Because he is actually being overwashed yeah. with that extra dense consciousness yeah. that's around him. That's what he's feeling coming from the machine because the machine should have nothing emanating out from it because yeah. it's trying to stop everything from emanating in. So is that like a displacement field then? Correct. Okay. Yeah. And and it's attempting to displace the fundamental When you core. said that, I, I just got this entire, just kind of like a chill when you when you talked about yeah. praying at the altar of the alien. And I've seen that quote from Jody Rose before. Yeah. Right. He's a, he says he's it all the time. Guy. Yeah. 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 And that's why. And see, he's so, um, I don't want to be, uh, you know, uh, shit talking anybody, right? Do it, do it. <laughs> okay. But, but the, the people that are involved are not particularly self-examining nor self-aware. Yeah. No. All right. Yeah. So the way he talks about it, he describes that without ever questioning why he's doing that, at least publicly. It, it would never dawn on him that he's being affected by all of that gathered up consciousness that, yeah, no, it would never yeah. be. Yeah. Because these guys are materialists and a lot of them are atheists and stuff like that. They don't really think that the consciousness is that they, they think that. No, that's but these guys actually know that, but they're in sort of denial because denial. they're trying to push it out of their damn machine. Yeah, right? yeah. Now, because there's another way, if you want to think about it, there's another way to do this, to do quantum computing. And that's to shove in as much consciousness right. as you possibly can, right? And do it the other way, so to speak, do the reverse of it. And that's what the Chinese are, are doing with some of their entanglement experience, uh, experiments. So, no, so in a sense, this is a mechanistic approach to something that we could say is actually metaphysics on the human to level. Technological control over something that could be accomplished better metaphysically. metaphysically. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Okay. Uh, and so, but we as humans are not um, so regimented. We're not so regulated. We're not so even in our temperament. We're not so uh, well educated as to be reliable in doing those kinds of things because basically we're a bunch of scattered, you know, apes that are all jittery from our, our caffeine. Coffee and, and sugar. <laughs> <shit>. <laughs> right, right. Uh, so you see what we're getting yeah. into though, in terms yeah. of, okay, so now the Mandela effect then we can say over time will disappear. It'll, we'll have flurries of it and it'll go away and so on. And that's why we have it in, and it is coincident with the introduction of quantum computing at the college levels. So when we first started getting the magnetic yeah. uh, or the Mandela effect, it was as a result of the quantum, it was temporally uh, linked to the quantum computing experiments becoming successful in the various research institutions. Mm -hmm. And then we see the, the burgeoning of the effect as the spread of these machines go out. Well, and then what happens when at a lot of these universities, they also have smaller versions of particle accelerators. They have smaller versions of CERN. Right. So that you have at some of these universities, I dare to say they have both quantum computers and particle accelerators. What does that what does that do? Does that create a whole other level of this? Uh, it does, but in a different way. They're going to use the, okay. the quantum computers because of the ability for the uh, transposition, the superposition of the uh, state of the qubit. They're going to be able to do things like uh, if you were if you were going to write a formula to devise a time uh, manipulation device, whether you were aiming at a time machine or not, a quantum computer would be the thing you would need to do your math, right? right. And you just run these experiments uh, 10 times, throw away the two uh, uh, errors and use the, the consistent eight others as your guide. And so if you're going to, for instance, um, 
in a non-consciousness format, but a mechanistic format, if you wanted to fold time and go from here to Antares, you would use a quantum computer to do the math for when to do the fold and, and what direction you needed to be facing when that fold occurred in order to get to Antares. Okay, because our, our standard computers just can't do it digitally. They're just not up to the task. We can't shed enough heat out of the chips to make them work that fast, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the, and the clock speeds are abysmally slow. And so if you're folding time, you're several layers above consciousness. You're at the actual materium. You're actually at that point where the little bloop has occurred and its time has folded into the ever present now. And, you want, and it's part of the ever present now. And so you want to be able to manipulate the ever present now. You need some heavy duty arithmetic to do that kind of uh, manipulation if you're going to try and do it mechanistically. Now, as we know from woo woo, the other approach is that you get the little alien spaceship and you jack yourself into it and get an image of Antares and then poof, there you go, right? And it, and it may be harmful <laughs> to, to us. There may be all kinds of side effects and so on, but it is the other approach to quantum computing, which is the entanglement, right? Now, entanglement works at all different kinds of levels. The Chinese are using entanglement to send 100% can't be um, uh, uh, spied upon communications between far distant places. What they do is out in space where it's isolated, where they don't have to cool anything down, they've got a machine that will take a number of particles and get them all entrained. And basically what happens there is that these little particles are all being recreated by the pulse in exact synchronization, as exact a synchronization as we can get here in this universe, such that when particle A fires off, particle B is also firing off. And these, these particles are, are created right next to each other, and then they're beamed down to separate receivers on Earth. So particle A goes to one area, particle B goes to another area. They can be separated by thousands of miles, and yet they will continually be in the same, be recreated by the pulse in the same rhythm. And so if you go along and you squeeze particle A and dampen down its recreation now, you can get particle B to dampen down its recreation in identical sequence and fashion and proportion. And if you had a little tiny machine that watched the, the flux of the two particles, you could use it in a Morse code fashion to send messages between each other. And you got, you got these machines separated by a thousand miles. Actually, the first test they did, it was 600 kilometers and it came off perfectly. Okay, they had these, the particles separated by 600 kilometers. They smacked particle A on the head and B said, ow. Uh, so, you know, it was just instant, instantaneous. No time is involved in entanglement. All right, so we have to let that come in there for a second. So you're actually dealing with, when they say quantum, you could also substitute that with That makes sense that entanglement can only occur where there is no time. That makes, per that makes sense. I get that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so it's a very powerful mechanism. And they actually use entanglement as one of the many processes, one of the many quantum computing processes that are involved in the little D-wave computers. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're using entanglement, uh, they're using um, annealing, quantum annealing, and some of these other effects. Now, entanglement is really interesting because it goes right to the core of consciousness and the idea that we could all become entangled. All right, they're in essence attempting to entangle us to atomic time on the cell phones and get ourselves synced into it for this next leg. Now, here's, here's my thinking. If we look at this historically, these devices, these uh, technologies, even the technology of tea and sugar are introduced into the society ahead of their need. All right, so we had tea, we had the, the uh, British East India Company out actually looking for drugs. They tried nicotine, nicotine didn't work. They thought it would work, they brought oh, it they over. They later from... went to opium, I mean, that was- correct. And, and, there, and then we have the ref, refining down to heroin because they're always looking for the ability to get this down to a, a um, specific level of deliverable, if you will, without any extraneous side effects, right? Or any side effects that they are not prepared to deal with. And so anyway, so if we look at what's going on, we see that there's a standard, there's a progression. And we, we have tea introduced into the British society at a huge cost, at such a huge cost that England went to war over tea, yeah. okay, with China. And, uh, and many uh, lives were affected around the planet because the industrial revolution needed tea to continue in the English empire. Uh, within the Americas, we had the ability to grow so many of the, the products here, but we never really got into tea growing. 
we were right off into a coffee. There was the tea, the, you know, the American Revolution and all of that. But really for our Industrial Revolution, we were into the coffee component. Tobacco, of and let's not forget hemp. Exactly, exactly. And, and so, and, but you know why they dampened down and, and suppressed marijuana? Mm -hmm. Okay, because it's the antithesis. It's the of, antithesis of, a, of an industrial era. Yeah, yeah. you don't right. really want stoners in in your uh, in your industrial system. As Correct. We all and know. also, but it also it in a in a very interesting way has always been known by meditators and uh, the yogis even now today in India use it in the meditative process because of what it does to the vagus nerve system. Mm -hmm. Okay, and because of how it plumps up and makes your adrenal gland happy and so on. So well, it's it screws with time too. Correct. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> okay, but now here's here's the thing. So um, uh, part of you can manipulate time. So really, the the sort of the title of the talk is how I learned to, to manipulate time and space on my summer vacation. On vacation, yes. <laughs> oh, that's a long vacation, so I'm going to experiment with this. So let's go. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so so we know it's all about spin, right? All right, so here's the thing about this. Um, many people will tell you that they've experienced vertigo and that in that spinning of their world, uh, that sometimes when that happens, they can recover, they can adapt, their body works well, but it never stops spinning. Their consciousness never stops spinning. And that every time they close their eyes, what's deemed to be false light, which is really biophotonic light, it's being interacted or being intercepted by your eyes without with the lids closed. And that's a sign of your own life and so on. But anyway, that um, image, if you will, uh, when you close your eyes, that could sort of yellowish, brownish, reddish kind of image, depending on what the light sources are around you. And sometimes it can even go into green or blue if you can remove a lot of the light sources. That image can be made to spin. Yeah. All right. When it, is, yeah. when it is spinning, what you're actually doing is through your, you have to get into a meditative state. You have to calm I've down. I've done this. I've done this. Where you this happen, I, I do this all the time. Yeah. yeah correct. You can correct. actually, part of it is spinning in the proper direction, if I'm not. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So on, a, on, a, on an anti-aging level, mm -hmm. there's, there's something the yogis have noticed about the spin over all of time is that it natively, without you monkeying with it with your own uh, minor level of consciousness, yeah. uh, it always wants to spin clockwise. Exactly, think of as clockwise, yes. Right? Okay, but if you want to do anti-aging, if you want to affect reality around you, you use your counter. consciousness to spin it counterclockwise. Exactly. Okay, so, yeah. that, so I sometimes, uh, dur when I'm exercising, when I'm running, when I'm on parts of the path that I know very well, I will often close my eyes and watch the spin. And it, and it will, what, what I, like, I, I have mine, I often see it as sort of like a disc spinning on a tether. Yeah. Right, okay. But what will happen when I do this, when I'm exercising sometimes, is there'll be a second disc come and join it and it will start spinning the other way. So as my yeah. act of exercising, participating in anti-aging, right? My act of yeah. doing something that is good for your body and it's showing me that I am participating in anti-aging when I'm watching that. You know, like I, I can actually see it happening. Right, uh, the, the point is not to show you it happening. You're right. just looking at I'm it. I'm just occurring. observing it, yeah. Sure, yeah, and the yeah. reason it's happening is because of what you're doing for the internal organs that are all connected to the vagus nerve that goes all the way back up into the brain and it goes into that part of the brain where the spin is actually originating yeah. and it ties it to the glands yep. so that all your breathing is controlled and everything. So the, and the yogis know that if you get into a particular kind of a breath work, uh, you can you get your parasympathetic nervous system to overtake the sympathetic nervous system and you can control that. Yeah. You can alter your your yeah. your spin, and yeah. one day you'll achieve it. You do the you do the work. There's a few tricks you can use, like um, you can torture the body one way or another to get certain mm -hmm. things to occur. Yep. And so one of the ways that they do it is that they you focus on your your gaze right at the end of your nose here, right, and it causes your eyes to. Go. I don't know if you can see this or not, yeah. but it causes yeah. your eyes to go, yeah. and then you just close your eyelids. And, and a, an effective long-term meditator, that's all it takes to put you into that particular state. And it hurts like hell when you start off. You can only hold it for a half a second or so when you first start. And then over time, you get to the point where you have that ability to just simply, as you will, and you go into this um, meditative state and you start affecting time. And if you were to close your eyes, you can actually get the thing to spin the other way. And, and it affects you at a... Um, at an anti-aging level, mm -hmm. but that's really not the point that point, the yogis no. were <laughs> that yeah. the yogis were attempting to do it right. 
because the point of it all is that at that level you're connecting with consciousness at the level that allows you as cozy rev had discovered to alter your brain mm -hmm. such that time is changed for yes. you now also you can get this to occur if you're if you've done it a long time and under certain circumstances this can occur such that you alter time for people around you as well and mm -hmm. so this is why we see um uh, instances where, uh, you know, famous uh, meditators living in a cave somewhere, a bunch of people come and talk to them every Saturday night. And when they leave after the discussion on Saturday night, everybody says, you know, wow, look, it's been 12 hours, but it seemed like one hour or, yeah. you know, it seemed like 12 hours and, and only two minutes have passed, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's because the, the time. The, or vice like, versa. Or vice versa. Like, correct. Yeah, I've had experiences while dancing that feel like they're 10 or 20 minutes and four hours have passed. I close my eyes when I'm dancing. I've right. had all sorts of um, interesting remote viewing experiences while dancing. Uh, what I would term, and I don't mean it in the way that I think a lot of people use it almost time travel kind of experience internal time travel i mean i literally you know that and it's always actually related to this spinning disc on the tether if the spinning disc on the tether is always whatever i'm looking at it's always kind of built around this spinning disc on the tether you know what i mean and i mean i've literally watched how they construct constructed the pyramids of egypt while i'm dancing <laughs> and, 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 and the t this thing this spinning disc will work its way into show you know into right. what's going on so I know exactly, what, and when I've done this, I mean, I might think I had my eyes closed and whatever for, uh, you know, just a few minutes, and finally I'll be pulled out of it by somebody who's come and tapping me on the shoulder because they want to say something to me, and two, three hours have gone by that I've been doing. Yeah. 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 And you have no, um, now, unlike missing time where they come and take time from you, under those circumstances, you don't have that hole, so to speak, right? Yeah. You don't have that feeling of, of lack of presence no because you have a continuous frame of consciousness is it because right. emily and i've talked about this we've talked about this in reference to certain experiences we had when we were young and the fact that both of us have sensed that there were what i called frames missing from a film strip that was the only way that yeah. i could really describe that that's the and, missing it time is, like cutting and it's trauma out. it's trauma because you're aware that it's missing but there's a con the continuity is much like a splice. It's yes. like a it's like a splice you would make in recording tape or film. It's it there's a conti continuity, but it's not the natural continuity. It's something that's been taken out or something that's been spliced in. And that's that goes back to Cozy Rep, and he calls it the flow. Okay. Yes. And, okay. Yes. And so within the flow, um, we notice certain things. So that people that go to prison. Uh, their bodies don't age as much mm -hmm. until they get out and then they rapidly age and, and they'll look at themselves, you know, five weeks after out, they're out of prison and think they've aged four years if they've done a long stretch. And it's because it all comes sort of piling up on them because they've been in this structure in which they didn't have the, the um, uh, impact on the their stressors. system. It's almost Correct. like that yeah. thing with the quantum computer being isolated from consciousness. Correct. Correct. It's okay. the same concept. And so it's just, just as you were going to earlier about the 22 trillion times a second and the $21 trillion missing and all of that kind of thing. And time who is money and all that stuff, right? Right. <laughs> right. Time is money. We're doing there. Oops, we're out of time. We're out of money. <laughs> right, right. But okay, so in learning to alter space and time, now in my particular um, alteration of space and time, uh, really it's time and space, uh, the space comes along naturally if you monkey about with time. And in my particular alteration, because I'm in the future predicting business, what I did was to use the knowledge to um, isolate words and assign words relationships to time. Okay. And then in altering time, so to speak, what I'm attempting to do is to reach out into the future and snatch back into the present the impressions such that I can send them back out again to those people that read my my reports and have them get a, a reasonably accurate image of the flow. And that's what I've been calling that section within my recent reports is the flow because I'm trying to describe it the way that Cozy Rev does. Now Cozy Rev had some really interesting uh, experiments and conclusions and stuff that he had done on his own uh, that uh, bring up um, uh, how malleable humans are relative to uh, time and how really interestingly weird consciousness is. All right, so one of the things that Cozy Rev does 
is that, um, uh, okay, well, let me see if I can think of the guy's name. Um, William Reich, remember the orgone machines Wilhelm and all that? Reich, yeah. Wilhelm Reich, yep. yeah. Yep. Right, okay. And so what they would do, would they, they had the idea that you could concentrate, you could, not time, but you could concentrate orgone energy and, and plump up the body in, in your consciousness and be healthy and stuff by using insulation and particular kind of an effect. Well, he and, also used it for like, you know, sex, sex drive or, or like, like sexual health and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, but see, he, yeah. yeah, and he was a little bit, uh, Weird, yeah. He was he's like into some, some strange it. stuff, yeah, right? Yeah. And he was sort of labeling the primal pulse, yes. and he and connected it to the idea of um, uh, the sex drives and all of that. Yeah. And true, it is connected, but you need to you know enlarge your thinking about all of this. Yeah. Right? Some people can't. Yes. Yeah, I know. I understand. <laughs> I understand. Some people don't think with the appropriate part of the anatomy. Right. Yeah. So so anyway though, but well, one of the things that that Wright did was the idea of the concentration here. And so we can get to the situation where we can find that um, uh, our effects at altering time uh, can be material, okay? As you talked about in our last uh, discussion where you had to race in to meet that individual, right? Yeah. You were actually actively altering your consciousness's yes. flow through time. As meditators, we know that when we get into it at a serious level, especially if you're doing the martial arts, it gives you a tremendous edge. Yeah. All right. It gives you the ability to flow through time at a faster rate than the other people around you, such that the, the Bruce Lee's real uh, skill was not his physical being, but his key, his key force, his ability to move through time extremely rapidly. And because he could do that, he could move and you couldn't react because he was so, so rapid, so fast. I would say this goes for things like gymnastics too, which I was, I was a competitive gymnast for many, many years. And essentially, if you are, I mean, yeah, if you can sort of get there before you actually get there, that, yeah. Yeah, you're in the zone. And in yeah. fact, that comes to the point of, um, you know, the thing now for um, martial artists and um, um, I, don't, I don't know how far out it spreads into society other than martial artists and programmers. But now the thing is microdosing with um, uh, psychedelic mushrooms. Lots okay. of people, yeah. There's a fair amount of people doing it, yeah. Yeah, and the microdosing is done at, at very small levels, like, you know, a tenth of a gram, that kind of thing. Yeah. And, they, and the goal for a lot of the martial artists is they think of it as being telepathic. And it is true. They're able to sense yeah. more, pick up more, and that kind of thing. Well, it also improves their visual acuity. And so you can sense the subtle, the subtle motions of the other person's body before right. they are aware they're making them. Right. But the yeah. big thing about psilocybin, about mescaline, to a lesser extent about LSD, and I'm unfamiliar whether it's uh, at all involved with ecstasy, but in these heavier psychedelics, even though you're doing microdosing, it, the effect continues over time because the, uh, you take a little bit of the mushroom, it'll have a neurogenic effect. It'll be still generating new neural pathways in your brain 10, 12, 15 hours later because of the half-life of it, right? And so if you do the microdosing correctly over time, you get to build up a certain level of this stuff in you, and then you go take some right before you go to um, uh, compete in a mixed martial art event at, at this microdosing level. And if you get your timing right in terms of how long it takes to affect your body and stuff, then you're right at the peak of the microdosing just as you're engaged in that activity. And one of the things about these particular class of drugs is that they are uh, pituitary, pituitary but also adrenal system affecting. They also affect the vagus nerve as well as the rest of the, the body and the brain, right? The body to a lesser extent. If you take enough of them, you get body effects, noticeable body effects. But if you take microdoses, you don't. You don't actually even really feel it per se. But there are perceptible, subtle changes within the way your consciousness relates to, to um, the reality around you and you know it's occurring. But they actually are able, in my opinion, because of these substances and because they've trained themselves, like the ancient um, uh, texts that we get out of the yogis and the meditators and so on, and the effects of that uh, certain chemicals have on the guys in Nepal, these fellows are actually able to alter their relationship to time. Mm -hmm. And they can move faster in smaller amounts of time. And so to a certain extent, that really enhances their presumed telepathy. I think that telepathy actually does exist because the, especially with psilocybin, especially with the psilocybin or psilocybin molecule, it actually causes you to have entanglement with the object of your um, consciousness. I agree. And, it, yeah. and that entanglement can go to the level of um, 
uh, conscious perception of the consciousness of another being mm -hmm. forming a thought and it, this then the movement right and so some of these guys say that you know that the, the microdosing gives them the edge and that's why they're on a winning streak and so on and if they could do it without the the, the microdosing and knew how to alter their their uh, consciousness, they could do it in a Bruce Lee fashion without necessarily having to take any kind of drugs. But it usually takes a long time to learn those skills as a meditator, mm -hmm. and it diverts you in your productive years from uh, being a professional athlete, so they're not really that inclined to get into it at that level. But there are classes. So we know from this, this little discourse here that it's my opinion that the powers that be have been using drugs on the social order in order to engineer the industrial revolution into the technological revolution into whatever their next evolution is. But we know it's also aiming at consciousness because they're now monkeying about with D-wave computers and CERN over here, which we haven't even gotten into what CERN's doing, right? <laughs> and we can sort of leave that as a sign. But our response to it has to be something because this is the viewpoint I come from. They're doing it to me. And so I want to have my response prepared mm -hmm. now that I've sussed out that this stuff's going on. And so our response can include altering our diet to remove the chemicals that they're putting in, getting better chemicals for ourselves that help boost us up, take those steps that help clear our body of all of the pollution. And that includes the, um, the extra oxidative stress that comes from all of these electromagnetic pulse things, right? Because mm -hmm. that actually, and this is the thing about, I'm, I'm in this terrible Twitter war with two people now about the G wave, about terahertz level five, the five G stuff, the the terahertz level uh, radiation, because it's my contention that that stuff does penetrate the cells. It yes. does go down to the micro mitochondrial level. It does cause oxidative stress uh, reactions to increase. And as an aside, you're going to get more instances of cancer. But that's not my concern per se. My concern is that the the five G waves are directly um, uh, able to impact the our own internal uh, consciousness clocks. Yeah, totally. That's okay. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And and so that's why with so, five. Oh, go ahead. So based on what you just said there, added to what you stated earlier, that they introduce these things in anticipation of their next move, without introducing any paranoia or fear means do we kind of go to the place where we get the sense that we are in fact headed towards some sort of artificial intelligence implementation no that's that's not okay. where i'm okay. headed okay right. the, okay the whole ai thing is a fud that they're creating to control the narrative okay okay and they know that people are, are susceptible to the fear, uncertainty, and doubt that's created by certain linguistics. They've got these linguistics pumped out into the useful idiot level of society where they're getting these people to uh, regurgitate this AI theme. Uh, ad infinitum. Well, and I'm doing it too, and that's why I'm asking this, because I don't want to be part of the echo effect that's, that's going right. through exactly. this. Exactly, an echo effect, precisely. Yeah. Okay, but they're trying to build that. It's a controlled thing where the, you know, as it dampens down, they get another okay. instance of it and send, send it out. So if it's not AI, then what is it? Okay, there's, there's the rub, okay. If we look at it a particular way, it may be that, that uh, CERN can't work without them controlling our collective consciousness. Yeah. Okay. Whatever it is they're attempting to get CERN to do may be thwarted by our collective consciousness not not cooperating. And so, but but I'm not going to intent. I'm not saying why they're doing this because that would be me speculating about weir what weird ass plot they've got. And we could even go so far as to say that CERN, being a very large version of what uh, Bob Lazar described as the uh, power plant for the UFOs, might be intended to go take Earth walkabout might be intended to just take us away from the sun and plop us some other part in uh, in this collective reality of the Milky Way would galaxy. That be, would that be a reason for blocking the sun so we can't see where we are in relation to it? No, I wouldn't think of that so much. The, the whole thing about the uh, chemtrails is uh, multifaceted, but um, uh, it's in, it has to do a lot with the atmosphere and what's been going on with it in the ozone hole, okay? The ozone layer is gone. We lost a big chunk of our atmosphere, 5%, 15% by depth, but 5% by volume uh, in 2003 with this uh, 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 cosmic ray burst that, that ultimately ended up causing the Banda Aceh earthquake. 
um, and uh, all of that devastation. At the time it did that, it stripped off a large layer of our uh, ionosphere. Thus, by the way, uh, what are those things called? Um, the Schumann resonance. Mm -hmm. There's, there's, you know, a dozen Schumann resonances. Very, right? yeah, yeah. Okay, I mean, there's actually a dozen frequencies. Different of it. ones, and, yeah. Right. It's well, not that they, they're changing; it's that there's multiple. It's a harmonic. Right. right. It's a harmonic. Well, that harmonic yeah. was was a, incredibly disturbed by mm -hmm. the reduction mm -hmm. of our atmosphere. So and much so, so uh, that it threw the atomic clocks off. Correct. And it, and it, it caused Earth to change. Yes, that cosmic ray did. was so so large, it threw us into a slightly different connection yeah. in our orbit. Now, this is all natural processes, in my opinion. Okay, As we get into these um, predictable 425-year uh, episodes that bring us into ice ages, we, we go through a period where the corona of the sun decreases, and more energy is able to slip over it and come back to the planets that it's dragging behind it in its comet uh, tail. We're in the tail of the comet. We're in this cone inside the tail of our comet, which is our sun. Comets are the metaphor of the universe. We're in a spiral heli uh, spiral fashion. We don't ever orbit around the, the equator of the sun. As a result of this, our relationship to the sun in terms of our distance from the sun changes over time. It changes over time because those cosmic rays come around the sun, smack into earth, they get trapped by the plasma, which is in the middle of our earth, which is this active, um, heartbeat of the planet itself, the plasma gets more and more energy. It's got to do something, so it creates matter with it. It uses the E equals MC squared uh, part reversed. It takes in energy and creates matter. The more matter, Earth has to grow. As, yeah. Earth, as Earth grows, its position within space behind the sun actually falls further away. Thus, we used to have a 300-day orbit. And we have the Mayans way back, or the the, what we think of as like the pre-Mayans, that little tiny segment that was sort of a, a, a civilization between the Olmecs, which we don't know anything about, and the Mayan civilization coming up. Those guys lived on, a, on an earth where they calculated 290 days in their year. And there's no reason to think that they were wrong. Everybody says, oh, they didn't know math and so on. Well, I don't know. Maybe it actually was a 290 day uh, orbit that we had at that time because the earth was a little bit smaller. It was back that far, et cetera, et cetera, right? And these things are episodic. It's not a continuous growth period. We have things that occur in universe and then Earth grows in episodes, uh, which I don't know why we got here. <laughs> oh, okay. So, so getting back to altering space and time and why we need to do it, right? Because there is, obviously, because of the uh, introduction of this, you have to think about it in a logical fashion. So Why we're talking the, about CERN and, and needing, our, needing yeah. our consciousness is to interact with, like needing to do something to our consciousness is to interact. With right. With and you, you hear about CERN, you hear the scientists say, well, CERN ought to work, only maybe it destroyed the universe. And, and so universe being self-protective goes back one second before CERN fired off to destroy the universe and it destroys CERN's ability to destroy the universe. And that may be because of our consciousness, right? Our consciousness is part of the self-protective nature, the self-healing nature of universe itself. They're saying, saying the Shiva outside of CERN is pissed off because she's trying really Correct. hard. To <laughs> Correct. <laughs> and so here's what they may be thinking. And this is just wild speculation at this point, right? Whatever the purpose is, there is a definite attempt to do an entrainment at a body, as a, at a physical body level yes. that is not only just using the generalized radiative soup, but is now introducing these 5G terahertz level uh, waves. I, okay. I, I, I agree, absolutely. There's definitely the, the, the entrainment for sure, yes. There's some kind of a plan going. Maybe they need to entrain our consciousness such that our consciousness does not intrude on their ability to make CERN operate. Now, I don't well, think isn't that kind of the Isn't that the kind of metaphor behind long-term evolution, the LTE, which is what they have called it. This Verizon ah, talks about long-term yeah. evolution as being the bridge between your your 3G, 4G, and ultimately 5G well, systems. Also, if they could- So what are they evolving? If, <laughs> There's the question. Well, yeah. but also, if they could entrain consciousness so that everybody is sort of having the same thoughts and feelings or whatever at the same time, or experience, then people are gonna think they're experiencing synchronicity, which people think is a good thing that lets them know they're on the right path. But I think, 
that um, my friend Chris Geo told me that years ago when you were on the show, you told them to watch out for synchronicity because that's actually more of a sign of systemic control than a sign that you are organically sort of Correct. where you're supposed to be. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Now, synchronicity in a in a ancient fashion, when you when you read about it in terms of um, uh, the brief mention of the effect within Patanjali's Yoga Sutras in the science of yoga, uh, was considered to be uh, harmonization, if you will, with universe. All right. But this is synthetic. But what's happening Correct. now is a synthetic, a synthetic copy trying to trying to entrainment. I mean, if you think about it, that's actually sort of what entrainment is. It's a synthetic. It's it's a sort of synthetic version of the natural, organic, harmonious, or yeah. synchronistic sort of way that human consciousness and universe. Correct. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. And so you see how, how how nasty it is to be a paranoid in today's society. <laughs> 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 there's there's lots of reasons to be paranoid, <laughs> and the, every every time you pop your head up, someone's inventing another one. But my point about this is, uh, you ha I ask myself frequently, why would anybody put the energy and the dollars and and the energy at a personal level to do some of these things? Um, it doesn't make sense, so to speak, right? So if you had a backlash against uh, newspapers uh, being delivered into your your mailbox, right? Uh, and well, the newspaper guys would stop doing it if, if the public rose up and said, no, we can't stand this. And they're taking the newspapers back down there and beating the editors over the head with them and so on. They're going to stop sending them newspapers. They're going to back off and figure out some other kind of content delivery. We don't see that with some of these technological pushes. All right. The Internet was a, was a cool thing. They didn't have to push that on society. It was self-evolving. Once they let uh, the rest of us have at it, we all saw the, the benefit but, of but it. But look at the marketing thrust that has gone into specifically the mobile telephones since the late 1980s. Yeah. I, mean, I, I knew guys that sold mobile phones. I know how they sold them. And they sold them the way you would sell fashion or cosmetics or the latest model car which is basically, it's trendy, it's hip, it's got these features. You know, they, they, appeal, they appeal to the transient sense of style that we have as humans. The to be dopamine current. receptors. Exactly, right? exactly. What exactly. people it think appeals. of us, yes. Your yeah. phone makes me sad, go get a new phone. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing, right? Right. And so it's a, it's a curious kind of a world relative back to, again, back to time. Now, um, as I was saying, I've been able to isolate words that are associated with time. So you can think about this very clearly. If you wanted to do and build your own system to replicate what I do with my web bots, you could do it all in Python. There's all kinds of tools for the web scraping. There's all kinds of tools for data mining. You don't even have to write those. There's natural language um, uh, processing mm -hmm. tools you can get, uh, descriptive web browsers that can be controlled by Python for your front end display. The only thing you're lacking is the key core essence of the of my uh, emotive reduction engine, and I'll tell it to you right now. And then someone just has to do the work. But basically, my emotive reduction engine makes some assumptions that are valid based on our body. And so, for instance, if we are depressed, we're thinking about the past. Mm. It is actually not possible for you to be depressed and think about the future simultaneously. You can't say you're depressed about a future thing that, that is going to occur. You can apply all kinds of other language to it. You can be anxious, fearful, uh, trepidatious, all of these kinds of things, but you're not ever depressed about the future. You can only be depressed about the past. Any language associated with depression, any language that is used in describing our depression can be, and usually is, uh, an effective clue to the mind thinking about the past. And if we, and if we go the other way, words around anxiety, about fear, etc., are all future-based. And so you can actually do this and get a dictionary and strip off all the definitions and, and decide which words are past-based and which ones are future-based, go out and do a web scraping and see if the general population within the places you're web scraping is thinking more about past stuff or future stuff. And then you can assign the future stuff to the values that are associated that come around with that language. And there you go, Bob's your uncle, you've got a web bot predictive system. You know, and it took me 20 years, but a lot of that was involved in but the value the web of your system. Until the value of your system and your reports has a lot to do with your own analysis. Oh, correct, correct. I mean, well, I'm not worried. See, that's why I don't mind telling people how yeah. to do it, right? Because <laughs> it's, a, it's a ton of work and probably most people won't. No. <laughs> but, and also it is a skill now, right? I've gotten good at, at, this, yeah. at this one level. 
but you can see how easily understandable my system is if you think about time in a particular way and think about humans in a particular way. So for instance, you think about humans and when we express language around our intestines, around our guts and so on, usually that's future related. Mm -hmm. Because where do we see anxiety and fear and stuff? It hits you in the gut, right? That kind of thing. So certain kinds of body indicators and, and that come up in conversation. Yeah, pain, can... pain, pain about the past does not generally come in the gut. It generally Correct. comes in the neck, the shoulder, the, 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 those kinds. Yep, you're right. Yep, yep, yep. yep. And the knots of, of the muscles yep. and so on and the armoring and so on. So, and you can actually go through, as I laboriously did, through an English dictionary and assign People all these values. People store trauma in their gut. They store trauma in the, those other areas of the body. The anxiety, which has about something that hasn't happened yet, stirs up the gut that it gives them. Right. Yeah, now, I, also, look at that physiologically relative to us being toroids, because yeah. that's where it narrows, right? That's where the focus, the in, input, the incoming of all of this is. And this is our consciousness that creates us in this form. And, and it is my supposition that our um, consciousness, part of my premise, is that our consciousness allows us to uh, leak in future uh, uh, sub, uh, future impressions, okay? Because that's really what it is, is it's future impression leaks into us through our bodies relative to um, uh, the gut and its uh, wide range of effects that can be delineated with the vagus nerve, right? So uh, respiration is more often thought of as a future kind of a thing than a depression and past and so on, right? And frequently they'll say, if you're, if you're feeling down and tired and, and so on, get out and breathe. You so, feel great, you know. So were Alvin, were Alvin and Heidi Toffler incorrect in char characterizing it as future shock? Can we really be shocked by the future? I don't think so. I don't either. I, yeah, I don't think so. And I also think that it's our energy body that first gets the impression as the pulse causes the future to be formed literally or actually a millisecond or two ahead yeah. of us encountering it. Our energy body gets that. So yes. we've got impressions coming in ahead of time. And Dr. Dean Radin's work, where he's had yeah. students mm -hmm. that would get a future impression 10 seconds ahead mm -hmm. of time, right? Yeah, so the, qu quickly, when, just what we were talking about with the gut a second ago, is this... Is that what is part of the reason that there is this sort of attack on the gut and the gut functioning to sort of distort our toroids, right? To distort distort our our natural energy fields in a way that our energy body does not properly get those impressions and can't respond in the way that we, that we naturally should. I see it a different way. I think okay. it, you're describing it in, in another way. But what I see is it's an assault on us. They're going through the gut in order to disrupt our ability to perceive those impressions. Yeah, they're yeah, not trying yeah. to shut them off. They're, no. they're not trying to shut them off. They're trying to cause us to not not. But the the, the distortion of our, uh, our of our toroid of our energy field would make the impression coming in be distorted. It would see. It, 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 correct. Yes. Correct. Yeah. But, and and their more crude form of it though is that they're trying to distort our material form. Yeah such that it's not connected as well to the to the uh, yeah. incoming consciousness and energy yeah. and so on, right? Yeah, yeah. Right, and so we now get back to the uh, learning to uh, distort time on your own. Okay. Because soon we're gonna be doing that. You know, I'm convinced of this. I may not live quite long enough to see it, but uh, I'm really hopeful that I'll be able to get hold of one of these little floaty triangle kind of jobs and I can decide, okay, I wanna go to the Pleiades for lunch. Right, that's sort of a deal, yeah. right? <laughs> okay, and those are all time distortion vehicles. But we're gonna have all different other kinds of time distortion things that we're gonna be developing now that we've got the uh, quantum computers and we're starting to, to tame those. And some of these time distortion things will work off of the same kind of principles that they're demonstrating with the um, consciousness expulsion that they're doing for the quantum computers. And what we'll see is we'll see time lensing mm -hmm. and time barriers. And so, uh, for instance, um, you can't have, uh, you could have very much more effective healing of the body if you could put the body into a situation where time was not pressing on it so hard, right? So lens to age the cheese and barrier or filter to heal the body. Correct, correct. Right. Or age the wine or, yeah. you know, accelerate or stink, the experiment. Or, stink or whatever we're... Right. Yeah, and, yeah. And, the, and it needn't be very large. And at first, they'll be touting these things in little tiny ways that will be hard to understand. But some guy will come on out and say, we've got a way now where we can create this electromagnetic field and we can put these bacteria in this electromagnetic field and we can get uh, 10,000 generations of bacteria to, to evolve 
uh, and it's only going to take a day and a half. Instant right. twelve years, twelve year old single malt scotch. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. Right, 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 right. <laughs> right. But by well, the way, they commercial. They have these commercials with like a Mila Kunis, where she goes and she barrels her own scotch and puts her stamp on it, right, and that, so that she can come back at a certain point, and, yeah. and you know when it's aged and that that's her barrel of scotch. But of course, that happens within the within the commercial, so maybe they're already doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and they could be, and they could be. Right. And of course, cloning can't I exist without Devil, it. I think it's called Devil's uh, Cut. The commercial is called for the, the type of scotch or, or whiskey called Devil's Cut, right? So maybe the yeah. de- there you go. Yeah. Maybe 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 that's the one who has the uh, the access to it right now. Right? There you <laughs> go. There you go. And of course, that's always been the purview or the domain of Lucifer too. By the right. way, within all of the sure. was yeah. was the control of time, right? Yeah. I mean, that's what Aleister Crowley essentially was trying to do with all of what, with all with all of this stuff, right? I and mean, and I, who is who is his top edged uh, proponents in today's modern society? Right, all sure. of those people that are in all, charge of CERN. All, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, absolutely. And I mean, and really, his ideal uh, ideas were so much a part of what went into the creation of programs like MK Ultra and whatnot with people like L. Ron Hubbard and Jack Parsons, they were creating these kinds of parameters for these operations to sort of act within. Cause I think that's really a lot of what they were trying to do with these programs. Yeah. That's what the Babylon working ritual was so, at, pa- yeah. at Palomar was yeah, I mean, Hubbard and, and Parsons effectively summoning yep. this, this moon child, which takes moon you child. into the Saturn moon matrix. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, you, you know, when I and I've spoken about this a little bit before, but when I really look into some of these kinds of programs and then looked into some of the factors of my own life and my own childhood, there's definite parallels there that I want, you know, this, I think a lot of what these programs are really about is about what we're talking about right here, this, this yeah. time control, you know, right. I, I mean, I've, 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 you know, stated on numerous occasions that I think a lot of um, what we term the secret space program is really a little bit more about some of these kinds of things. It is, it, yeah. Go it back is and now, listen. Yeah. Listeners can go back and listen to the shows we did with Og Telez where we talked about that. Yeah. Yeah, and see, you can see how it's all extremely central to everything, basically. Everything. It is. And, it tie, and it ties all of these things can, are all examining the same subject from a different viewpoint and with a different level of focusing lens on it. And, and it's because we have a tendency to compartmentalize and all of this that we end up with this structure uh, under which we're living at the moment. Now, my data sets would tend to argue that we're going to, that we're busting out of it at, at this point, okay? Mm-hmm. And that the powers that be are taking a real risk. They're not able to take us where we need, where they need, think we need to go in the old style pyramid power structure, all right? Because the, they have to push down into lower levels of society, greater levels of complexity in order to be able to lift the whole social order to this higher level of interconnected, greater complexity. And so this is the fear that the Department of Defense has. If they give me one of those TR-3B floaty anti-gravity devices, and I sail around and I use it as an RV, and you know go camping with this stuff, there's nothing to stop me from weaponizing that. And so because they've basically given me a huge chunk of power. And so that's what they're afraid of. And that's why they don't introduce free energy. That's why they don't introduce the anti-gravity devices, except under extreme controlled uh, uh, conditions. There's also with the anti-gravity devices and stuff, still there is language that suggests that consciousness directly participates in that process and that not everybody can fly these buggers, right? Nope. Yeah, I, com- I completely agree. Yeah. Okay. And so one of the reasons for bringing up this whole thing about altering time and how I learned to do it on my summer vacation is that when you get into summer these days, all the people that are listening to this, uh, one of the ways you, one of the things that you might want to do is to relax away from the uh, industrial uh, mm-hmm. society, the technological society and its drugs that are driving you a particular way and build up your ability to spin counterclockwise, Mm -hmm. not necessarily for the anti-aging, but for the anti-control component, Mm -hmm. right? And you breathe better, you live longer, you take the the stress away, and you're no longer in a particular victim state about it, right? And this also removes this mantle of victimhood in terms of uh, the targeted individuals and all of that kind of stuff. If you think about it and you do some of these techniques and and, uh, so on, right? One of them is to learn to focus 
right at the bridge of your nose with both of your eyes and then close your eyelids and keep that focus with your eyelids closed. That alone, just that little body trick, well, it'll hurt. And, and if you keep at it, you'll get to the point where all of a sudden you recognize that you gained through the hormetic process an interesting different kind of connection in the neurons in your brain because of the physical things you're doing to your body at a level that's not, it's really sort of the parasympathetic nervous system because it's one of your senses and you can control it. You can't really cross your ears or your nostrils, but if you could, the effect would be the same in terms of the neurogenic capability mm -hmm. and the anti-control skills that this would give you. I, 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 I so nice. that's funny what you just said about you can't cross your eyes and your nostrils. Sometimes when I'm on my run and I'm getting like towards like when I'm pushing it hard and I'm getting towards the end, I'm starting to get winded. I'll do this funny technique. I don't know what made me start to do it where I'll breathe in one nostril and breathe and out the other. Then breathe. Yeah. I don't know. I never told. And then that's then actually with, a meditation technique well, well, then, as well. Then with the, well, then with the then one that I'm just, then with the one, so what I'll do is I'll cross them over. So I'll go like, I'll breathe in through the right, yep. out through the left, then in through the left, out through the right. And it yeah. makes me, I don't know if it makes me forget that I'm tired or it makes me not tired. No, no, it actually changes your physiology through yeah, your vagus nerve. I can go for another half an hour. When I get to that, if I start doing that, when I get to that point where I'm just about to drop, I can go for another half an yeah. hour. Yeah. yeah. And it's the alternate uh, uh, nostril breath control that, that the yogis do. And, and curiously, I was supposed to have a meeting with... Um, uh, major league sports team uh, tomorrow morning to record a video on consciousness science uh, for them. And we were going to start picking up off of that. I can't say who the team is. I, you know, if they want to say that's fine, but it's an experiment on my part. Yeah. I want to see if I'm able to actually increase the performance and aid these young people because, you know, a lot of these guys are 17 years old. They need something, you know, <laughs> they, well, I, they're pressurized. I, 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 and do you, do you, are you interested in sports? Do you follow sports? Nope. <laughs> okay. So on a certain level, I'm actually not at all either, other than my own involvement with gymnastics. Yeah. And I've gotten into following particular sports. And the for, sport that I find most interesting to follow in relation to the kinds of things we're talking about right now to be tennis, because tennis is actually quite based on geometry and time, taking time right. away from your opponent, creating and more rhythm. time. Rhythm. space rhythm yeah. and if you when you look at some of if you look into the backgrounds of some of these tennis players and some of the things that they're involved in it's almost as if they're acting for the archetype of some of these ideas that we are talking about tonight i i i would love to have like i love getting i mean i i've done I've been guests on other people's shows talking about the occult and esoteric aspects of tennis, and people are shocked to find out that those things exist. But I've discovered <laughs> them, and then people have caught on to it, and they're like, I see what you're talking about. And this even ties into, I've even made observations related in, with the help of some of the other people, connections to the cryptocurrency markets with tennis, all sorts of interesting connections between Roger Federer and Satoshi. They're, like, right. Very interesting thing. You know, so sometime, not, you know, I, I would be interesting to see if it's interesting to see what you could sort of net in about tennis from some of your web bots stuff because there is a whole that what's going on on the court is 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 is, is inter entertaining but what's going on with the is sort of uh, surrounding the matrix all, yes so yeah. it's, it's fascinating yeah 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 and you can say probably say the same about any individual given sport but i don't i don't follow any yeah. at all i like yeah. used to like participating in some in our new house i may decide that i'll take up some you know maybe go back to surfing or something like that yeah although i, I hate surfing up here in the northwest because it's cold Freezing. And yeah, yeah, you wear a wetsuit, but you still have that cold shock and then you got to deal I, with it. But I, actually, but I may go back to that. You know? I actually think surfing and I've never done surfing, but it's something I've considered to begin doing. I actually think it's an important practice for the time that we're entering, entering into because I think one's ability to be able to ride the waves that are coming yeah, is exactly. really important. So I, from a metaphysical and symbolic perspective and just also generally the way that you sort of discipline and train your, your body and your mind together, I actually think surfing is a great thing to take up at this time. Time. Sure. And, and I, it's just like sailing. It's just, um, uh, it'll be a little bit more convenient to go out with a, a small surfboard than to lug out a big boat, basically, yeah. Yeah. Uh, for, for our new, new environment. But um, yeah, so, so fundamentally, now, we haven't really even gotten into any of my notes. <laughs> We've been <laughs> generally jumping back. around. And we're running out of time again. I know, I know. Um, the, and, and I've got tons of notes here, but, but basically we've covered all of the, the basic ideas, right? Except we need to tie it back to our, our uh, Farsight RV guys. Yes, right? exactly. Okay, because see now, that's a really weird um, uh, conundrum. How can consciousness, and we can say this one way, how could consciousness travel across time 
to uh, probe this woman in our time if she was uh, re remote viewing someone in an ancient time. And that, that uh, brings us up to the idea of, if you will, dueling ever-present nows, if one wanted to think about it a certain way. But Cozy Rev has another way of thinking about it, okay? And he calls it the flow. And he says that past is past, the ever-present now is all we've ever got that we live in, and that we get future impressions, and we can alter all of these, but that they are all basically separate for all time, but not in consciousness. And so if we think about it the way Cozy Rev does, then what was going on there was that in that ancient time, in their ever-present now, as the pulse existed for them, that being actually <laughs> felt the remote viewer drop her connection yeah, to the our time impression of what she was doing right and yeah. so so he was actually interacting with his future impression which is her ever present now mm -hmm. and there is no temporal conflict because it's all occurring at the level of consciousness now this is even more elevated well, this if all, the this goes to your quantum your, your qubit thing because if if consciousness and time c can be isolated from one another it almost and because remote viewing even though we think of it as being about time because people are always trying to find out what happened in the past or the future it's really actually all about consciousness so it isolates yeah. these time yep i get it yeah yep yep and so there's no mute there's no they're not mutually conflicting they're not exclusionary they're very compatible views and it is not really all time happening all at once and cozy Rev was he even built this device okay and this device he built i i can't think of what he called it in russian but basically it's a like a giant um uh targus uh only he used a mirror or he used a a, a polished stainless steel it's cozy rev mirrors that is what they correct correct yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. It's cozy <coughs> and, mirrors. And what, yeah and and it really it it's it's um it really was like an orgone chamber in a sense yeah, yeah. but it was for visible light and was for magnetic effect right and the thicker the metal you made it out of, the more the effect occurred. But not everybody could stand even being in these things because of the yeah. nearly, um, well, because of the psychedelic level of yeah. experience that you would yeah. get in there, right? And if your mind was not prepared for it, uh, so in his experiments with these things. Well, if you're not prepared to entangle with yourself in the other, in the other ever present now or in the other parallel other dimension or something like that, then you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, and so he found that three quarters of all the population that was uh, was invited to participate, no matter what uh, their their body type, their gender, their age, but about seventy five percent of the people would get about a foot and a half in and then come back out, hmm. and so they never even really experienced the full effect. So there were only about twenty five percent of the participants that could even go beyond that stage, and of those twenty five percent of the participants, nearly every single one of them presented. Um, what we might think of as both a psychedelic experience mm -hmm. that was incredibly disruptive to their personalities, okay, just like a regular psychedelic experience would be, but they also presented, let's say, prescient evidence or evidence of prescience, okay, and, and it could be that it was also evidence of, of far knowing, not necessarily knowing anything into the future, but something that had occurred right at that moment, but several thousand miles away that sort of thing. So whatever the effect was of this very simple device was not within the device itself, but within the effect that that device created within the, the human participant. So, so in essence, it was a human as a yeah. qubit. Yeah, so okay, so I think I've asked you this before, but maybe not. Have you ever watched Fringe? No, I've never seen, I don't see television at all. It, it, neither, neither did I until I was directed to watch Fringe. And then there's so much interesting stuff in Fringe. And I've gone so far as to compare you to an observer from Fringe. So at some point you may want to take it. <laughs> Maybe I better check it out. Yeah, and I've also, yes. actually, what's funny, and it's funny that you bring him up, I've compared both you and Courtney Brown to the observers in Fringe. So that's interesting that you brought him in tonight. Yeah. But in the first, se first two seasons, first season of Fringe, they sent Olivia, who was sort of the person whose consciousness was prepared for these kinds of things because of her training in MKUltra kind of programs when she was younger and certain alter, uh, alterations that had been made to her body through the introduction of certain kinds of um, uh, like maybe lymphatic fluids or different certain kinds of things. Okay. Okay. She would go into a, a this, uh, this old uh, kind of anti antique typewriter and clock shop 
and they would give her a key to a back room that only she was allowed to go to that had left her there. The room was completely black. She'd sit down at the computer, at this, at this old typewriter, a particular typewriter. She'd sit down at it. There was a mirror there. She'd look into the mirror at a certain angle while typing and basically communicate with a parallel universe, like a, a, okay. a, a with, yeah. with another, an ever it's automatic writing, basically. Automatic writing. And yeah. she would yeah. receive, she would basically, a communication would be set up between her and something that was sending information. Of course, sure, an entanglement. Of course, later, later on in the show, it turns out that she's also the person capable of crossing into this other universe where there was another version of her that was almost exactly the same with sort of small differences, right? right. But this, this came much later in the, in the series. But basically, the, the room that, that, that she was in sounds like a, 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 a mock-up or a remake of sort of these chambers that you're describing. Right, right. It sounds yeah. like just going to the same point exactly is yeah. the attempt to isolate. Yeah. Now we, we know that this goes so far and you can achieve great results with this because the yogis were able to do that. They did experiments about isolation of their own consciousness, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all kinds of remote viewing, uh, prescience, you know, and all of this sort of thing and, and detailed all kinds of records of it. But it'll only take you uh, uh, so far at a particular level. And it is not, uh, that level of technology is not assess accessible to the control structure because they can't make you do these things, right? Mm -hmm. And they couldn't make all of us do these things to aid them. And so we see that they're into this, um, as you say, this gross materialism and the idea that they can use CERN to make all this stuff happen, or they can use right. the, the terahertz waves, which, you know, indeed do penetrate down to the cellular level, do mess with the vagan nerve, do monkey with your mind, etc. And so something's up that way. So this is actually, um, the observing of the uh, exactly of the social of the social order maturing and the introduction of these kinds of things parallels some of the things I'm seeing in the prescience within my uh, reports that basically a few years ago they decided to the powers that be decided to take the plunge and see if they could accomplish whatever their goal may be mm -hmm. and in doing this to to try and accomplish this goal they're going to release us into this sci-fi world. Mm -hmm. And by release us, I mean, they're going to introduce more technology and allow it to go further down within the social order, such right. that we will attempt to accomplish their goal, whatever, again, that might be. Yeah. And, and I don't ever really go there. I just consider myself to be um, uh, an unwitting participant, very much like a drafted army guy who's mm -hmm. merely trying to, you know, keep his wits about him and survive in very chaotic conditions. Uh, well, you're basically are... acting as an intelligence operative in that sense, because yeah. you're gathering information, you are doing analysis, but you don't have, you're not analyzing the motivation behind it. Correct. I don't, I don't answer why questions, but I, I do observe what's going on and say I can make these conclusions from I don't know that it's possible for us to answer why questions, because if we understood why, we'd be the psychopaths doing it. <laughs> <laughs> or you'd be, you'd reach, yeah. if I even knew half of my own motivations, I'd be truly enlightened, you know, and could do right. all kinds of things, right? <laughs> so. Your your own motivations, but Correct. you know the yeah. people when when people say things like I just they, they can't get their head around why people would do all this pedophilia kind of stuff. Yeah. You're not supposed to understand. If you understood, then you, you would be exactly be doing what they're doing. So yeah, yeah. So yeah. um, we're we're we've blown right past all time markers here tonight, which sure, makes sense sure. because we're we're in the process of deconstructing Destroying time. time. <laughs> <laughs> Did we get reasonably close to some place here that we can? Yeah, tie this, tie this together. And right, and, and I think it ties it all back with the RV and with the, the understanding that the, the ever-present now is only singular, so to speak, within our lives in this material reality, but that everybody's ever-present now is always tied to this level of consciousness, and it is that consciousness that we can control all of this. So the way to control and alter your time and space, how I learned to alter time and space on my vacation was learning to alter consciousness. The only consciousness I had around was mine, and it was easy to play with. It was there all the time. And so in doing that, uh, I actually am able at many different levels to alter the time around me. And I've noticed some of the effects more recently where I can get things done very rapidly that would otherwise you know, seemingly take longer time, et cetera, and be more productive with it and uh, enjoy the time component more. And, and so we've given some of the viewers 
Uh, here are some of the hints as to how to go about it. Much of it is meditative. If they wanted to go the psychedelic route, I would suggest they, they stay with psilocybin or mescaline because those compounds are more related to time than many of the other psychedelics. And, uh, and there's also the time and telepathy and entanglement component that we probably need to explore <laughs> in some and other that, And that will be part four. <laughs> be part <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah, and absolutely. see, there you go. The only way out is, is in. Is in. Yep, yep. Yeah. Is to dive deeper. Right? It's, it's, right. That's exactly where <laughs> yeah. we go. We're going to end this on that note because I think we've given you all a whole lot to chew on. Yeah. Some of you will do uh, a lot of note taking and get back with us on your uh, take on this and we welcome the interaction. Um, we're going to move over to the members section for a brief time with Cliff. And so that closes it out for this time. This is Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. You can find us at patreon.com forward slash Off Planet Media and offplanetradio.com is the website. I'm Randy Moggins with Emily Moyer and our very special guest, Cliff High. I guess we'll be back again for more time, another time. Until then, it's time to go inside. See you. Oh, 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 oh,